Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Mary Angela Saavedra. I'm the director of the Center on the Hill. It's so very nice to see everybody this afternoon. Thank you for coming out. It is my great pleasure this afternoon to introduce uh, my husband, Eric Gershenow, <laughs> who is here uh, to speak with us. Uh, today, Eric has a bachelor's degree in chemistry with a 20 plus year history of working in the biopharmaceutical industry, currently operating as director of API development and manufacturing at Iveric Bio, based in New Jersey. So he's going to talk to us today about the science of creating a new medication. So please welcome Eric Gershenow. Thank you, Mary Angela. I like how I, I was introduced first as the husband, <laughs> above all of us. So I know the, uh, the title slide here, How a Drug Practice Made, is slightly different than what was advertised in the flyer. And just to make sure everyone here can hear me clearly. Yes. All right, excellent. I don't get up too often with the opportunity to stand in front of a microphone, so I, I, uh, I'm gonna indulge here, or indulge me, please, here. Um, so we're gonna talk about, again, how drug product is made from conception to commercialization. I know there have been some speakers that have come here that have talked a little bit about drug manufacturing, or maybe the back end from the medical industry, maybe patient perspective. This is gonna be a little more heavy on the science piece and more focused just on some of the aspects tied to how those drugs that you get either in the hospital or from the shelf are actually made. So we're not gonna really talk about um, insurance or medical industry so much, but um, this is just giving you some background here. And as Mary Angela mentioned, uh, again, my name is Eric Gershenow. I do have a bachelor's degree in chemistry. I went straight out into industry after four years. I was, I was good after four years of education. I wanted to get my feet wet in the industry and the job market, even with a chemistry degree, was in biotech. So that's where I've spent my entirety of my career is in biotech principally um, supporting development and manufacturing activities tied to therapeutics. So that is encompassing of, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, probably a huge part of the market, which some of you might be familiar with, are antibodies. So there's a lot of work in, in the pharmaceutical space around antibody manufacturing development. But I've also had the opportunity to work very closely with folks who are doing gene therapy, which Philadelphia is one of the huge hubs in the US. It's probably the mecca for gene therapy because you have University of Pennsylvania and you have Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, both with, um, uh, you have scientists that are really operating at the cutting edge of, of this technology, uh, specifically focused on gene therapy, as well as what I'll refer to as small molecule. So, as Mary Angela mentioned, uh, currently I'm working at a small company called Iveric Bio. The company is focused principally on retinal diseases. So they're positioned for retinal disease treatment. So the, the board and a lot of the executive leadership team are all like eye doctors. But uh, we have one asset that's actually, we just filed an NDA recently. We're looking to uh, get feedback from the FDA and potentially go commercial by the summer. So it's a very exciting time for the company and uh, a lot of what I'm doing really ties into what I'm presenting here for you today. So the first slide I wanted to go through, just a general overview, just to give you a 10,000 foot view of what's all involved from conception to commercialization. And then as we break down the components of this slide, um, in subsequent slides, I'll go into a little bit more detail here. So where does it all start? It starts with what we call preclinical phase. So in this phase, this is where you have a company that's look, considering, okay, what is the indication that we want to treat for? And based on the indication, <clears throat> we'll look at scouting potential molecules. Well, this is what we're talking about. It's really just raw chemistry at this stage. And based on the design of that molecule, we can predict to a certain degree the potential efficacy or impact as a, as a therapeutic. So in parallel to doing that, what we'll do is once we target a molecule of interest, we'll perform what are called tox studies. So we'll go into the lab and we'll synthesize or generate a small amount of this material. And we're looking at dosing 
using certain models in order to test before we actually go into testing human beings. So toxicology studies is looking at what are the limits that I could actually dose a patient uh, to establish a point before it, you know, it becomes potentially harmful to a patient in order to establish dosing limits. In toxicology studies, we'll also look at potential efficacy you know, some kind of response, we don't, we're not looking for a dramatic response, but some kind of response to the therapy. So safety and efficacy to a point. And once we have gone through this process of generating this tox batch, doing some preclinical studies with this material, typically takes one to three years. And then we looked at it and filed if we think, hey, this looks like a worthwhile asset to invest some more time and energy into. We'll file what's called an IND. So you'll see as we go through my presentation here, there's a number of three-letter acronyms. All the industries love three-letter acronyms. I'll be sure to carefully define them for you as we move through. So an IND is an investigational new drug. So it basically amounts to a dossier that we put together that captures the aspects tied to the actual toxicology studies as well as what we call CMC, which stands for Chemistry Manufacturing and Controls. Basically, how we go about making this stuff. So all of that will go into an IND, and we'll submit that to the regulatory agencies. In the US, it's gonna be the FDA. And the turnaround time is gonna be relatively quick. We're really just looking for the FDA's blessing to say, okay, this looks like this could be a potential therapy. Uh, the talk studies look good. And then we proceed into what we call the clinical phase. So this might be something that is somewhat familiar to folks in the room here. You might have heard of phase one, two, three clinical trials. This is really where the heart of the development of a drug, potential drug therapy resides within this clinical phase. You can see this takes approximately two to 10 years. And this is really the phase in the drug development that could be the make or break as to whether or not the therapy actually gets approved. So in phase one and two here, we're starting with a very small patient population. And these are usually patients that are clearly suffering from whatever the indication is that we're looking to test this uh, potential therapy for. But we're really focused primarily in phase one and two on safety more than anything else. So again, we establish limits for dosing based on our toxicology studies. Here in phase one and phase two, we really look at refining what is going to be the dosing strategy. What is the dose that we want to be able to administer to a patient while ensuring safety? We don't want to see any adverse effects from dosing this medication. So in phase two, we're looking at a slightly larger population size, greater than 100 people, but still less than 1,000. So and again, phase one and two, primarily focused on safety. When we go into phase three, now we're looking at a substantially larger pa patient population. And here we'll have multiple studies, and typically they'll run up to about a year, 12 months. The FDA requires that at a minimum, you have 12 months data supporting in phase three. And again, in this case now, we're shifting from safety. I mean, safety is still obviously a primary concern. It is the primary concern all throughout this entire process. Uh, but now we're starting to look at the impact, the efficacy of this therapy. Is it doing what we want it to do? So in the phase three clinical trial, we're looking at a population of patients that are gonna be dosed with what we call a sham or a placebo. And then there'll be a population of patients that'll actually get the therapy that we're looking at. And these are all blind trials. So the patient doesn't know. The clinician who's dosing the patient has no idea. So we, we'll, we'll get this data after 12 months. We'll compile this data. And that is what will end up eventually being presented to the FDA. Now, in parallel to that, while all this is happening, in order to provide material for dosing patients, right, this has got to come from somewhere, this all comes from our manufacturing side. So this is really where my role comes in. So we have our clinicians, our clinical team, that are working with the patients here. 
the team that I'm a part of, uh, technical operations are really focused on how do we make the stuff. So we have a quick and dirty process to make material for our talk studies. Now we're really looking at getting into the, the finer details and kind of polishing and establishing a process by which we can make the material and manufacture it to a certain level of quality. So there's a lot that goes into this. That's why you're looking at two to 10 years. Again, not only for the dosing, for the phases of the clinical trial, but for the progression, to allow the progression for the manufacturing. So during this window of time, we'll be producing um, what are called batches. So think of it like baking a cake. Uh, not as simple, obviously, but the steps that are involved are similar, right? We have our CMC, our chemistry, manufacturing, and our controls. There's our ingredients that go into baking a cake. That's our chemistry. The manufacturing piece, that's basically the steps involved in baking the cake. And then our controls are the specific values, the measurements, how many eggs you put into the, into the cake, how, many, uh, how much flour do we measure out. So we have specific controls that are put in place to ensure we produce a certain level of quality that's being dosed to our patients. Once we've gone through this whole step and fingers crossed, we get really good results from our phase three that show, okay, not only do we have a good safety profile, but the drug is doing what we want it to do. Then we file what's called an NDA, or a new drug application. So this is the, the ultimate test here. This is when we compile this 10 years worth of clinical data from dosing, as well as we outline the details of our chemistry, our manufacturing, and our controls that go into a much thicker dossier compared to the IND, and that gets submitted to the FDA. Typically, this takes about one year for them to turn around a review. In the case um, where you have, say, an unmet need, there's an indication that there's no current treatment for, and if the company has demonstrated a good safety and efficacy profile, from their phase three data, the FDA will give what's called breakthrough designation. So the FDA will shorten the review time from one year to six months just to push that drug out onto the market and get that into the hands of patients. <clears throat> Again, fingers crossed everything looks good. During this time, the FDA typically will be funneling questions back and forth to the manufacturer just to get clarification. But if all looks good, then the FDA will give the green light, and then we move into what we call phase four, which is commercialization. Now, the challenges don't change, or don't, they're, they're, they don't go away, I should say. There are different challenges now. We move into the commercialization phase. Now it's about maintaining quality and what we call life cycle management. So as we produce these batches, um, how do we maintain that level of quality um, and how can we, in the background, we can do some, um, some improvements to simplify the process. In some cases, we may look to increase the scale or the size of the batch in order to meet uh, demand, you know, based on feedback from our commercial teams. So that's sort of the 10,000 foot overview of the, everything that goes in from conception to commercialization. Now I'm gonna drill into some of these specifics here. And we'll talk about preclinical first. So as I mentioned, preclinical is where we're starting from ground zero here. And the first thing you need to do is establish what's the indication you're looking to treat for. It sounds kind of obvious, right? But it's important to understand what disease you're looking to treat because there's a very big difference between treating a neurological condition versus, say, a heart condition there are different metabolic pathways that are involved, different chemistries that require specific and unique set of expertise in order to, say, target a therapy to treat for, or, yeah, for the indication. So we have a long history of drug development um, and manufacturing here in the U.S. and abroad that um, as compared to maybe 200 years ago where folks just stumbled upon the Medicaid, oh, hey, look, this works, penicillin, hey, this is great. 
Now we actually rely on chemistry libraries. So based on the metabolic pathway, which all diseases derive from some metabolic pathway that occurs in your body, we can target chemistries of a known, not only the, 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 the chemical aspects of that chemistry, but maybe the spatial conformation. So think of like a lock and a key. These aspects can impact the, the metabolic pathway and subsequent uh, symptoms that are associated with an illness. So we can reference these chemistry libraries, is what I'm calling them, uh, in order to pick potential candidates that we can screen for doing our initial talk studies. Oftentimes, once we establish a chemistry that we want to pursue, we'll generate material that is of a crude nature. And when I mean crude, I mean it's kind of dirty, it's not very clean. And that's somewhat intentionally so, because we want to, again, establish limits for um, testing models in order to, to determine what's safe, what's not safe. So we'll work with what we would call the worst case material being generated by a crude process. The other reason why we do this here, this crude approach is Again, we're not looking to invest a whole lot of time in developing a process because we don't know if this is a, going to be a valuable asset or not. So we want to just get something to the clinic as quick as we can for doing toxicology studies. And those studies involve what we call in vitro, which means an uh, artificial biological environment. So think of like a petri dish almost or a cell culture that you're working with to what we call in vivo models. And this is where you hear about animal testing um, to, to look at things like safety and efficacy to establish whether or not it's worth to take this drug further and, and look at dosing actual human patients with it. Uh, again, looking at safety and efficacy, the, the, it's more about the safety at this stage though. Um, and again, we're looking to establish a threshold or a limit for dosing in, in actual human patients. So, Based on those toxicology studies, if everything looks promising, then we would carry it into the actual clinic. So again, phase one, phase two, primarily focused on safety. We are looking at efficacy at this stage, but we're really looking at establishing what levels that we want to target for actually dosing the patients. Because everything that we're doing at this stage is all about laying the foundation, the groundwork, because you have to have a rationale when you're presenting um, from every angle to the FDA, and this is a huge piece of it. Phase three, again, really looking at efficacy, primarily dosing uh, the actual medication versus a sham to the patient. And, uh, and the, again, the background, and this is where I'm gonna probably focus most of my talk here, is, is about the actual process by which we make it. So my title is Director of API Manual manufacturing and development. API stands for active pharmaceutical ingredient. So every time you take a look at your bottle of Tylenol, you'll see, it'll say the active pharmaceutical ingredient, it could be ibuprofen, whatever. And then there's all the other components that go into that little pill that you're swallowing, right? That's part of what's called the formulation. My role is principally just looking at manufacturing that active chemistry that is actually doing the work that's treating the symptom or the illness in the patient. So there's a disparity between what I'm calling drug substance and drug product. The drug product is what you're buying off the shelf or what the, what the doctor's giving you. Uh, this is what's going into the drug product, the actual drug substance. Again, we'll create multiple batches of material, partly to fuel our clinical studies and again, it's really for us, though, to refine and improve the process by how we make it. So the key word here is quality. And we have a whole separate team that is dedicated to quality management with, and you'll find it in any biotech organization. So how do we ensure quality? Well, a huge component of it at this phase is establishing what we call analytical tools. So if you think about things that you can measure, 
from the drug product. It could be things like pH or osmolality. Um, could be just like a visual inspection. What's the color of it? These are ways that we characterize the actual drug substance and establish what the bar is in terms of quality so that we know we're generating material that is certainly going to be better than what we established during our toxicology studies, but ensures that we can maintain a certain level of quality predictably when eventually we go into a commercial space and start manufacturing this material. Uh, during this phase, though, there's a lot of scrutiny within our team. Every time we generate a batch, we want to make sure that we go through and we review everything from documentation associated with it, analytical results to make sure all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. Again, because this is all being built into the foundation of what we ultimately submit to the FDA. But eventually, when we move to a commercial space, we don't want to have to be doing that routinely. Because if you can imagine, in a commercial space where you're routinely manufacturing a therapy, you don't want to have to go through every entire batch with a fine tooth comb. So we put a lot of energy into the front end here during this clinical phase to establish this process. So we have, again, CMC, chemistry manufacturing and controls. Our controls are our analytical tools that we use to measure. And then we also have within, say, the processes that we use to manufacture, we have controls that we establish specifications for based on what's demonstrated through reiterative or iterative batches, which I'm just specifying right there. So process validation of manufacturing skills support commercial launch. This is all a huge piece of all the analytical tools and these specifications that we establish feed into what we call validation. So before we go commercial, we have to perform what are called PPQ, or Process Performance Qualification. We say we can achieve X, Y, and Z, or perform to a certain standard of operation, and then we validate that by running, we have to run a minimum of three batches consecutively. That's what the FDA wants to see. Three gives us a statistical valuable uh, result to show across three batches we can consistently manufacture in the same way every time. So that's what the validation piece comes in. One of the key tools that we use, and I'm, I'm not going to get into a lot of the specifics about how it's made, but to say that um, there's a number of technologies that we rely on. Filtration is one of them. It's an integral component that you'll find in any manufacturing process tied to the production of any, any drug therapeutic. And when I say filtration, you could think of like your coffee filter uh, as, as a, a simple example of it. You put your coffee grinds into the filter, you put water through, water comes out the other side with brewed coffee in it, but you retain your grinds in the filter. Similarly, as similarly, as we manufacture, when depending on the what we call expression system or the mode of how we make the therapy, so for small molecules I mentioned earlier, we can actually synthesize these. And this is actually the case for the Moderna vaccine and the reason why they were able to get it out on the market so quickly. They use chemical synthesis like you think about a lab with beakers and such. It's exactly that, using raw chemical, um, raw chemicals that, that are being mixed to actually build that chemistry of interest. Oftentimes though, like for antibodies, or in the case of gene therapy, these are called biologics because we're using a biological expression system to manufacture it. Uh, think of this like brewing beer. Right? You have a big, giant metal fermenter. You put in yeast and sugar and your barley and your hops, and the yeast converts the sugar to make alcohol. In the case of drug therapies, you're using a cell culture. Instead of the cell culture producing the alcohol, it's actually programmed to produce the therapy of interest. 
The hurdle in the biologic space, though, is you have to show clearance of all these other biological components. You have cells that are present. You have other viruses that are present in the bioreactor. So we have to be able to demonstrate we can remove those, what we call, process impurities so that we have this refined drug substance at the end or the difference between the raw fermenter and that nice bottle of beer that you get coming out the end. There's a, a process in between. And just like brewing beer, they will use filters to remove the yeast and the barley and all those other components. So similarly, likewise, we'll use filtration to remove some of these gross particulates in the manufacturing process. There's a certain point, though, where filtration only goes so far because now we're talking about fine separations between molecules that are closely related to each other, either in size or in the nature of their chemistry. So in those cases, we have to lean heavily on very fine separation technologies. And at the heart of just about every drug therapy manufacturing process is what we call chromatography. Now, some of you might be familiar with this term, but as it applies to the biotech industry, what we're talking about is using uh, some kind of solid support, and that's what I'm displaying here in this little funnel. There is a solid support, in this case, these are little, little beads. They look like little grains of sand, but on the surface of them, they have a very specific chemistry. Now, in this case, we'll introduce in our, our, our actual product volume. And just so everyone's aware, this is all what we call wet chemistry. Everything is in fluid form. So our product is going to be cultured in a liquid environment, and we're going to be processing a liquid volume throughout the entire process in order to refine it to the final drug substance. But in process, this liquid will contain various uh, molecular species. Some of them, again, are going to be product, what we call product-related impurities, so they're very close in nature to the actual product of interest, but they're just slightly different, just enough that it makes it challenging to separate them using filtration. But we can use chromatography, and we introduce this liquid, this what we call a mobile phase, it moves through this solid support. And because of the chemistry on the solid support, which will be complementary to the chemistry on these molecules passing through, these will actually stick to the solid support. So the fluid, the mobile phase, will pass through. The, chem the, the molecules that are in the mobile phase will now bind to that solid support. Once we've achieved that binding, we can achieve a very fine separation by exploiting the differences in the chemistry of the molecules that are bound to the solid support. Oftentimes we do that by introducing a salt solution of varying concentration. So as we increase the concentration of that salt, you'll have different molecular components that will come out apart from each other, and then we'll use what we call fractions here to separate those volumes out. So the first volume will collect some measure of impurity here, then we'll introduce a slightly higher concentration of salt to elude the next round of molecules, if you will. And then finally, these guys will come off at the end. And we can track this using a detector system. Usually we're using ultraviolet light to monitor this. And we get a response every time a molecule comes off here. You'll see a little peak that pops up on the detector. And then we'll get this, what we call baseline separation. This allows us to tease apart these different molecules. And then we can identify using our analytical tools, which one of these peaks do, or does our product rely, uh, reside in, and where do our impurities re, uh, reside in. 
Once we've identified that, then we can take this purified volume, throw these guys away, and then take this downstream for further processing. So again, there's a, a plethora of technologies that we use, but chromatography is probably the most critical that we rely on for these very fine separations. And like I said, every drug manufacturing process, whether it's small molecule, whether it's gene therapy, whether it's antibody, will use chromatography. To give you some practical sense of what does this look like in a lab environment, uh, this is our solid support here. You can see it's literally, this is what we call a column, and it literally is that, it's just a little tube with this solid support packed into it. You have a fluid handling system here, so this is a pump. Then you have your little fractions that sit on top here, and you have a UV detector here. So your detector sits on the outlet of this column as you introduce different mobile phases with different salt concentrations. We're measuring UV, and then this fraction collector will just move and then get our separations that way. This is what you would see in a laboratory scale. So this would actually fit right here on the podium here. Typically, we go through what's called pilot scale. So again, to validate the process, lab scale has its own unique challenges, but some differences in terms of how we operate when you compare it to pilot scale and manufacturing scale. So we progressively make the scales larger and we verify our controls that we have in place for how we run these steps. So at pilot scale, we get a little bit bigger. We now move from a bench top to the floor. You can see this system here is about the size of a refrigerator. All of our pumps to move our fluids reside in this system, as well as our detectors. This is our column with our solid support that has our chemistry on it. And these are our different solutions that we're using to achieve those separations to eventually go to what we call the manufacturing scale. Again, the whole point in going through this process is we use the laboratory scale to establish conditions for operation, but then we have to verify them at pilot and manufacturing scale because sometimes what you do here may not always translate when you go to this scale. You can see, in this case, our columns with our chemistry on them are much, much bigger by comparison. This I could hold in my hand. This, I would need a crane to lift this up because it's made out of stainless steel and glass. And oftentimes you'll use some columns that are even larger than this, like a whole human being could fit inside of them. But this is ultimately the scale that we want to go to. So a lot of what we're doing during the clinical phase, again, as part of process development, is establishing optimal conditions for operation and we verify them by scaling up through our analytical methods by which we test and characterize. So once we've gone through, again, the clinical phase, we've done our clinical trials, we've gotten data back from testing patients to look at both safety and efficacy, and in the background, our CMC, our Chemistry Manufacturing and Controls team has been frantically, <laughs> frantically developing and verifying our manufacturing process, we now move into the commercialization space. So again, based on the feedback from the regulatory agencies, the FDA, we'll hopefully, fingers crossed, get approval of our new drug application, our NDA, and then at that, phase, that step we go into phase four, which is again, primarily focused on life cycle management and patient treatment data. So now, it's gone commercial. We have a commercial team and a medical affairs team that interfaces with doctors. So you can imagine doctors actually will gather. There are conferences specifically for doctors to usher in new technologies so that these people are in the know. 
but we'll have a medical affairs team that will separately go out and engage with doctors' offices directly, share them information. The medical affairs team kind of overlaps a little bit between commercial, but also the science piece. And it's really to help bridge the gap in understanding and knowledge for the doctors to be able to provide recommendations to patients as to whether or not this therapy makes sense to pursue. But the idea at this stage is now you start to impact a, a much larger patient population. And as doctors are treating patients, the data that we get back feeds back into the organization so that we have an understanding of how is this therapy impacting a much larger patient population. Uh, again, at this stage, it's really engaging directly with our commercial teams in order to manage forecasting for batch production. Again, everything is made with like a, like a cake. We're batching everything. We make so much of material at a time. But if we see demand go up, then we have to modify our batch schedule. In the case of my company, right now we're planning for a commercial launch. We have a certain scale for manufacturing right now, but based on the anticipated commercial demand, we're actually looking at producing at a, a larger scale so that we're making more at one time so that we can reduce the frequency in number of batches that we're producing per year. And there's some key advantages to doing that. Uh, clinical research doesn't stop, though, at this point. Um, in this phase here, once it's gone commercial, we have essentially a platform for dosing and treating the patient. But in the background, our clinical team will still be looking at doing more research around, say, alternative devices for delivery. So for example, if you think about retinal treatments, um, the treatment that we have currently, it amounts to an injection in the eye to treat the retina in the back of the eye. That may not sound very appealing to a lot of people. It doesn't particularly to me. So our clinical team will look at other modes of delivery for that medicine, as well as different dosage rates. So we established a limit, again, from our toxicology studies. But maybe there's a dosing range within that safety margin that we could look at modifying that could elicit a different result, maybe something better than what we established for what was originally filed with the, ND, with the FDA. The other piece, too, is tied to what we call formulation. As I mentioned before, when you get that tablet that, you're, uh, that could be Tylenol, ibuprofen, whatever, there's the active ingredient, but then there's the other components that are put into that pill that you swallow, that's part of what we call the formulation. So we might look at modifying the formulation either to make the, the patient experience a lot easier or in order to maybe enhance the shelf life of the material. One of the things I did mention was as part of the drug development and manufacturing, I mentioned we have analytical tools that we use to characterize with Part of the life cycle management is supporting what we call stability data. So the shelf life of a drug. So we establish an endpoint for stability. It, for our therapy, for example, our target is five years. So we want to be able to demonstrate up to five years we can hold on to a batch of material and it'll still be good. So again, this is all supported by um, analytical data, but this is also what drives the commercial model. And in the background, once we've gone commercial, we'll also, my team will continue to do process improvements, primarily driven around cost reduction to manufacture. So a lot of what goes into the cost of making a drug really is the manufacturing component. Typically, say for a batch, and I'm just roughly averaging, it costs about $2 million for us just to produce one batch of material. So that cost then um, it gets dispersed across how many drug vials uh, we can actually produce out of a particular batch. 
So one of the benefits to going even larger is it helps to bring the cost down because now you're simplifying the way you're manufacturing it. You're not making so many batches a year. Uh, you're only producing a handful of batches and you're reducing the schedule, the time it takes to make it. So these are a lot of things that manufacturers are thinking about even beyond the commercialization piece. How can we make this stuff and bring the cost down? And this is my last slide here before I open it up for questions here, just to give you maybe a snapshot of what my world looks like. This is what I'm calling the Drug Substance Manufacturing Galaxy. Uh, DS here stands for Drug Substance here. This is the universe that I live in specifically. And because I'm part of a small company, you'll see most companies in this space tend to be small with the exception of the Pfizer's and the Merck's. There's a few big companies out there that have the kind of infrastructure to do everything from soup to nuts, but most companies out there don't. Ours is one of them. So oftentimes we rely on contract manufacturing organizations or CMOs. Those CMOs, they are our external partners. They are responsible for doing all of the tech development and all the experimental work to support taking it from the lab scale to this manufacturing scale. Uh, they, we work very closely with them uh, for document review because anytime you do an experiment, there's gonna be a report that's generated from that. Anytime you make a batch, there's going to be documentation records associated with that batch that we have to review and sign off on. And before we can even start an experiment, we need to have a protocol in place that outlines the specific details of that experiment. Uh, and then they also help, and we work with them for, say, troubleshooting when problems do come up, because trust me, they do. Next to them, we work very closely with our internal partners, our analytical development team, or AD. Again, these are the guys that are responsible for owning the various tools that we use to characterize and track and measure quality along the way. So they will help to develop these tools. Uh, they also manage, as I mentioned, will perform what are called stability studies, will we'll store product at various conditions, and we look at the impact of things like time and temperature on the stability of the drug product. And they also help establish our, what we call, specifications. So again, all these tests, they give us information about the quality, but through multiple batches, we can demonstrate, we can reach a certain level of quality, and then we set that bar by saying, here's, here's the, the specification here, every time we need to achieve greater than or equal to that specification, otherwise, we toss out the batch. Uh, and they also, again, that also ties in with the rationale and justifications for how we go about manufacturing. Our AD team will also work with, oftentimes, third-party facilities because our CMO may do some of this testing, but there may be specific tests that they don't have the capability to perform, and our AD team then will manage these additional tests. As I mentioned, quality is a huge component all along the way, everything from conception through validation and manufacturing, our quality teams, our QA, quality assurance, is very closely tied into all the activities. Anytime I put my signature on a document, our quality team has to approve it too. They have to review it and sign off on it as well. So they help to basically keep us in the lane, on track, and ensuring quality. In addition to that, we also have a product or a project management team. So you can imagine you've got so many cats here, you need someone who's going to herd them. Uh, our project management team is responsible for owning timelines to get things from one step to the next, and they help to keep the rest of the teams in line and on track, and they really drive a not only internal alignment within the teams, 
but also align it with our external partners too. So they manage a lot of the day-to-day -day communications. We also have a materials management team. So as you can imagine, once we make the stuff, what do we do with it? Our materials management team is responsible for providing and facilitating shipping, as well as storage and maintenance of our material. And like I said, some of the critical steps here involve getting approval from the FDA, from the regulatory agencies. So to ensure that we're doing things that are in line with what the regulators would look at, we have our own internal regulatory team. These folks here are the ones that interface directly with the FDA and other regulatory agencies, say in the case of your filing a therapy overseas. The EU has its own separate regulatory agency apart from the FDA and different guidances that you have to follow. So our regulatory team is going to be clued in, very aware, and plugged into what those requirements are and we'll relay the back, those back to our team. And of course, our legal and finance team because these guys are crucial for approving any anything that we want to do. So if we want to work with the CMO, everything we do requires investment, money. And that's where our legal team comes in to give us the stamp of approval in order to facilitate that. I did mention drug product, right? That's the actual therapy that the patient sees. What our team is responsible for is just manufacturing the active pharmaceutical ingredients. So once we do that, that gets handed off to our drug product team. They have their own little universe that they exist in where they interface with a lot of the similar teams here. And then of course, our commercial teams that we engage with in our medical affairs that support forecasting and planning and they collaborate with our stakeholders. So hopefully I gave you in this presentation some sense of what's involved in the manufacture and delivery of a drug product and with that, I would open the floor to any questions. Yes? How many um, new drugs do you try to develop say, within a year? All right, so the question is, how many new drugs do we try to develop within a year? That's a really good question. So most pharmaceutical companies will have a pipeline with multiple therapies in the pipeline at various different stages, principally because you don't put all your eggs into one basket, right? Because we had in the case, well, actually with our company, it was a different company about six years ago. They had an asset that was in the pipeline and it failed phase three. At that time, they only had one asset in the pipeline. Because of that, the company had dissolved. They uh, regrouped, rebranded, and now in addition to that we have uh, four other assets in the pipeline. So it really just depends on the bandwidth of the organization. For a small company, typically you'll see a handful of assets that are in the pipeline, primarily because each asset is, uh, it requires so much time and energy just to manage the day-to-day -day operations that you could have a separate team dedicated to each asset. In a larger pharma company, they have the resources to do that. So you'll see for the Pfizer's and the Merck's, they may have a multitude, a plethora of therapies that are in the pipeline. And because it takes years to move them from concept to commercialization, they'll all be at different stages. So for a given year, you might be working in phase three for one molecule, you might be working at the toxicology phase for another. So it really just depends on the size of the organization, what sort of bandwidth you can manage for the programs. Can you tell me a little bit more about what a biologic is? Okay, so the question is what is a biologic, or can you explain a little bit more of what a biologic is? So a biologic really is something that is derived from a, a biological source. So uh, a small molecule, Really, if you think about it by comparison, um, it's simply that it, it may, you, you could, you're talking about it at the atomic level. 
when you're talking a biologic, this is something that is manufactured by a cell culture. So as I mentioned before, oftentimes antibodies uh, and antibody therapies, which comprise a huge percentage of the market, uh, a lot of the autoimmune suppressive drugs um, are derived from biologics, and they are complex biomolecules that, if you will, have somewhat of a personality to them. They're a little bit finicky because these are macromolecules. They're very large and tend to have a, a spatial conformation associated with them that facilitates their functionality in your body. But they're derived from a biological source where a small molecule, you would synthesize these from raw chemicals. A biologic, you're actually growing those in a cell. That's really the key difference. And that's the expense then related to biologics, and that's the new. Are there more companies developing uh, processes for biologics versus, or is it very, is it specific more to the, a very unique disease or disorder? Or? So the question is why do we pursue biologics versus other modalities based on the indication? And that, that, that's, that's a huge piece of it. So I think a lot of it is really based fundamentally on the history behind drug development. Biologics has been a model that has been used since the conception of drug therapies. And small molecules is a space that has been in existence, but it's really now just starting to expand in terms of applications. Um, just to give you an example, the therapy that we have filed an NDA for, it's what's called an oligonucleotide. And that is essentially translates to as a small snippet, a very small snippet of DNA that we're constructing synthetically. So it's not being made in a cell. We're using raw chemicals to make it. And it's what's called an aptomer. And all that means is it has a very specific shape to it. So it's not the chemistry that um, provides the, the active mechanism, but rather the shape of it that inhibits a part of the metabolic pathway. And as we've seen, some of these small molecules have value um, as far as treating patients' illnesses, then we are, we're starting to see the expansion of that industry, in particular the, with, say, the Moderna vaccine, the Pfizer vaccines, that's really opened up. <coughs> I think a lot of interest in expanding and, and, and seeing that part of the industry grow, but historically the bulk of therapies that have come out have been driven from biological sources, and so that's a known platform um, because there's a lot of experience in the industry. You know, I talk about process development. In most cases, we don't have to start from scratch because the foundation's been laid already using biologics. So again, it's, it's a known pathway uh, to drug treatment or developing drug therapies that it's just something that folks have a natural tendency to, to lean towards. But again, the challenges with biologics is you have to show that you can clear all these biological components that go into making the therapy. So there's a bigger hurdle in terms of the safety profile that you have to demonstrate or small molecules because we're chemically synthesizing them, the only impurities that we have to remove are very closely related impurities that don't present the kind of challenges from a safety perspective the way biologics do. I think this is an easier question, I'll be quick. So when you get to the commercialization and you use your medical affairs department to communicate the docs, and what's the, what, who and why do they make decisions and put everything on TV, and when? So in other words, when you engage the public, is it almost, do you wait to do the medical affairs kind of practice and see whether docs like it, or do you simultaneously, do you think the industry puts out, as soon as you have an approved drug, you see it on TV and therefore the patient's asking for it? So the question is, when do we start seeing commercials for the drugs? <laughs> so, yeah, so, it's, it's a really good question, and um, I will say this, before a therapy even gets approval from the FDA, uh, and I know this because we have weekly 
company meetings. My company is only about 200 people strong, so I get to have a weekly company meeting. My CEO is on, on the call, our medical affairs team. And there's been a lot because now we're at a phase where we submit our NDA. There's more attention focused on the commercial and the uh, medical affairs team where we haven't gotten approval yet, but our medical affairs team is going out to these conferences where all these ophthalmologists are going. They call it Congress. So they go out and they meet them. They have, uh, you can think of it like a poster presentation show. Sometimes there might actually be a representative from the company that is on a panel that is presenting and talking about the therapy. So it's getting your seating and educating the, the doctors first before the drug is even approved, just so that they have awareness. So that once you get commercial approval, at that point, doctors are just waiting. They're waiting, they're anticipating it. So the commercials really then are, are more just for the general public. So once we get the approval, then our commercial team will start working with you know, agencies that their, their focus is nothing but developing commercials. So they'll, they'll, they'll find actors and they'll find uh, the TV crew, you know, the camera crew, whatever. But that, that, that'll happen after we go commercial. Yeah. Yes? Cells were used in the development of the COVID virus. Were beetle cells used no, in the fetal, development? Fetal. Fetal. Yeah, fetal. Fetal, fetal cells used in the development of the COVID vaccine. That's a good question, and I don't have a very clear answer for you, only because I I haven't been directly involved, and I and I don't. It, depending on the company, right? So I know that at least for Moderna, it's it, because it's all synthesized. I don't know if they're using that maybe as a, as a, a model for testing efficacy or safety. Um, so I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have a clear answer to your you question. Know if it's being used in other in industries like cosmetics, etc. No, I really don't, yeah. to be honest with you. Now, it, it, it really just depends on I guess whatever the legislation is around the use of that, there may be applications where fetal cells are used, but again, that's that's more on the R and D side. Uh, I'm not so plugged into that directly. Yes. So we are now bombarded by medical ads. Yes. If you've got this thing with psoriasis, please you know, get talk to your doctor about blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of them, they say, and by the way, to get you diarrhea, blindness, or <laughs> All the side effects, yes. And I'm wondering, at what point do those side effects prevent it from becoming commercial, or how few people can die for 100, or, you know, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, so again, it, they wouldn't be advertising unless it was FDA approved, so... It, it depends on, I guess, the modality of treatment or what the indication is. So if I'm thinking of what's coming to mind immediately is there is a treatment now that has an FDA approval for the treatment of Alzheimer's, which there is no treatment right now. And this therapy that was approved has some side effects associated with it, uh, one of those having to do with brain swelling. And you're thinking to yourself, that does not sound appealing. The, the benefit of the drug versus the side effects doesn't really seem to weigh out. But in that particular case, I can say, because there's an unmet need, the FDA, I think, was looking more to set a precedent to say, we see how urgent it is to have a therapy at least available. Ultimately, it comes down to the patient. And you have to educate yourself as much as you can because there's there's a line between you know managing your health and, and then being you know sold on this drug. Hey, this this could, and, and doctors may be incentivized to push a particular drug. So really, uh, at that stage, it, it comes down to just educating yourself as much as possible and ultimately making the decision for yourself whether or not side effects are worth the benefits of the treatment. But yes, I to your point, it, it almost seems like you're watching Comedy Central when you're seeing some of the side effects that, that go along with some of these therapies. But is there a, a number of 
negatives that then preclude the FDA from saying yes? To, to a point. There, there is a threshold, yes. Um, I can't say specifically what that is. I don't, I'm not intimately versed in how the FDA reviews and approves, but certainly there have been therapies that have gone through FDA approval, made it to the market, and then, like, say, FenFen, for example, when they saw larger populations being dosed, that there were um, heart murmurs associated with that. And as a result of that, they were forced to pull that therapy off the market. Sam, you had a question. Uh, a few months ago, there was, the president uh, stated and restated the fact that he accelerated the, uh, or had some force uh, to accelerate the uh, development and, and the distribution of, of uh, drugs for the virus. Yes. Uh, assuming that it's true or part true, uh, what did he do and how would he do it given the, the structure of the organizations that you deal with here? Did he, did he uh, accelerate it and get the drug on the market a, a month or two or six months faster than somebody else? So that's a really, really good question. So, again, we're not setting a precedent here. The question was, sorry. Oh, sorry. The question was, if I can rephrase this correctly, with the... Um, the government fast-tracking the approval of the vaccine, are there ways to apply that to, say, other other pipelines, other drugs, correct? Yeah. So, yes, to, that, to answer that question, yes. Um, part of what facilitated the COVID-19 vaccine, at least for the Moderna I know, from, to, to get fast-tracked and approved in such a short window of time, a lot of it has to do with the way it's made because it's synthetically derived. Part of it has to do with the fact that the, I mean, the pharma industry has such a long history of how to go about manufacturing and developing therapies that there's a lot of pre-established procedures and ways that we approach it. So really, it comes down to uh, testing in patients, efficacy and safety. And in the case of COVID-19, we had such a large population of people who got infected in a very short window of time. So we had a huge patient population to do the testing on. And because of the understood pathways in the body, we could, we could the science was solid so that at least the approach, I think in that case, didn't present a challenge from a safety consideration. That's what facilitated that particular case. Now that may apply in some therapies, but not necessarily across the board. But hopefully to your point, you know, one of the challenges is being able to take a drug from conception to commercialization to shorten that window because there's a lot of, especially in the case of gene therapy, which is really targeting orphan diseases, diseases that affect a very small percentage of people but have very huge impacts in terms of quality of life. How can we get these therapies to patients sooner? That's so, something the medical industry or the farm industry and the FDA are working co collaboratively together to help short some of those timelines. And I think that's the last question that we, we can do one, we can do one, more. one more question. I want to take a question from you. Thank you. <laughs> um, I had a cousin whose wife um, had some form of cancer, I forget now. Uh, she has passed from us, but it was a long time ago. And the doctors couldn't help her at all mm -hmm. after a while. And so she went on to um, natural products. Mm -hmm. All right. So she would go and get things there, and she made her own um, diet of what she ate. And she was a nurse, and she knew what she was doing, and she did that. And eventually, when she would, she should have been dead by year five. She wasn't, and so they came after her to find out what she was doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that sold me because I watched this happen, and uh, she lived for another four years, I believe. And they were very interested in why she, what she did and why she did it. But in the meantime, I am now interested. I'm on various things for various mm -hmm. body things. And I go and I get supplements. One of the supplements that I'm looking at right now, and I, I had to bring something to do it out loud, is a, a, 
I want to ask you about is the difference um, uses curcumin and turmeric essential oil. It is the intake about 10 milligrams of aluminum every day, <coughs> all of us, off of our, our cookware cosmetics, beverage containers, lotions, over the counter drugs, all that. We get it from every place. Mm -hmm. So, if you would like that, um, it would, he's saying that the combination of the curcumin and the turmeric essential oil, the TPE, that combination reverse the negative effects on the brain um, for memory, the things that were causing you to lose your memory, um, both brain function, other things than that. Um, and it can bring it down, depending on how much you take, up to 52 times the lower, the level. So the question is? So the question is, do you believe in these supplements? Because I can see why I've watched other people mm -hmm. do travel all over the world to follow down a lead and bring it back home yeah. and then get, make so, money off of it. <laughs> so the challenge, so to answer your question, here's the question is, do, do I believe in, in supplements? So just to draw a line here, there's, um, there's, there's this play between, if you want to call it Eastern and Western medicine, which I'm uh, an advocate for both. So if there are lifestyle changes that you can employ uh, from exercising to things you eat, supplements, um, I'm all for it. it. In terms of the science behind it, one of the challenges in the space is there's not a lot of proven research. That's the gap because there's a lot of conjecture, there's a lot of um, you know, patient monitoring, but in terms of understanding the chemistry of what's happening, there's not a lot of knowledge in that space. And I think that's one of the challenges of getting anything accepted within, say, the medical community. They want to see the research. So there could be testimonials from people, but unless there's something scientific that characterizes that pathway, whatever it is, um, you'll see medical doctors won't give you an advice other than what I'm just saying now. And that is, if it works for you, then by all means, uh, I wholeheartedly encourage you to do it. In terms of the science behind it, I have no idea. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Eric. Thank you for being with us. Thank you all for coming. Please join us next month. Uh, we'll be back with the authors of Tasting Freedom, the Octavius Cato story. Um, they'll be here to lead a great discussion about um, the early stages of civil rights during the Civil War. So thank you so much for coming. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.